So welcome to Haystack Live, and I'm now going to hand over to um, Abel and Joel of Digitech Galaxus, who are going to tell us all about uh, A-B testing uh, and search experiments. Over to you. Oh, by the way, before we uh, I, I pass on, if you have a question for the team today, um, please drop it into the Zoom chat, um, and then I'll ask those questions on your behalf um, at the end. Uh, and I might ask you for some clarification if I if I need some. Um, and as I said, the, the session's been recorded, so everything will be on YouTube later. Uh, but anyway, over to you, Abel and Joel. So thank you very much, Charlie, for the introduction and also for the, for the invitation. So I will share my screen, the first thing. Uh, screen, share. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Right. So everybody can see my screen. Is it okay? Is it okay? Then and now I will start. So so this talk it's called a brief uh, tale of search experiments. It's presented by Simon Joel and me. Simon is uh, not here, but he did a lot of uh, work on the uh, in the background. Uh, before I start with the agenda, so I will just uh, with the presentation I will just t tell you the ag agenda. So the first thing is we are going to talk about who we are. Uh, then we are going to start asking us a, an interesting question, how can we improve the search results? And the way we are going to answer this question is with a brief tale of a search experiment, no? And during this discussion about this experiment, we are going to have an interesting question about which offline metrics should I optimize? And this is it's a question that is, comes over and over when we, when we do offline evaluations. So we think, um, many of you on your teams have also this kind of uh, interesting question, and we are going to find out which metrics are not not good. So unfortunately, we are not going to tell you which metric is the best one and the one you should use. But I think if we tell you how to find out when a metric is not good, you can uh, uh, throw it out, and that's also really uh, fine. And we are going to provide you a framework how to do it. And after what we are going to talk about a, a little bit of Bayesian optimization, because this is something we have also introduced to in our experiments. And the way we introduce Bayesian optimization, at least in our uh, by Digital Galaxus, is quite interesting because it's because we saw a video also in Highstack about Highstack USA, uh, the conference, and there was an interesting talk uh, uh, from Doc Turnbull when he talks about this Bayesian optimization. And we thought this is something we should actually try to introduce ourselves. And this is what we did. And also Dr. Tan, but he's given a, a, a course in, in Sphere, and he's also given a, a one class about a Bayesian optimization. I took it, and it's quite a, kind of interesting. And I think it's, it's, it's a tool that maybe a lot of teams had also have to introduce. It's, it's as important from my point of view as a learning to rank, but we can argue after the presentation about that. So a little bit about ourselves, as I told you, so we are Digitech uh, Galaxus, the biggest e-commerce in Switzerland, but we are not, we do not only have shops in Switzerland, but we also have in Germany, in Austria, so if you are in Germany living right now, uh, please try our shop, Galaxus, if you don't speak uh, German, uh, you can also try it because our shop is in English, French, uh, Italian, and English, so if you speak one of those languages, you are, you can use it. Uh, our team is growing, so if you would like to join our team, uh, feel free. Uh, even if we are based in Switzerland, there are other uh, team members that are also in Germany, so that's also an option. So feel, please feel free. Uh, so now let's start with our with the presentation with a quite simple question. No, so how can we improve our search result? And probably of uh, many of you have already quite interesting question, uh, answers. No, for instance, you can say, "Why don't we try vector search?" No, that's something that was talked a lot in in Berlin uh, high stack. You can also think, "Why don't we try to introduce learning to rank if you haven't introduced it already?" So machine learning. So I'm going. We we already have introduced uh, learning to rank. But I'm going to talk about another way to solve you, to try to improve your search results. And it's basically trying to just adding and removing features from your search algorithm, no? Also trying to adjust uh, some boostings or uh, weights. And this, these questions uh, always uh, comes, or quite often are, uh, comes because somebody in your shop so some bad results. It can be somebody in your team, which is also good, or maybe some customers. In our case, 
uh, the example I'm going to provide you, it, it, everything starts when when we noticed that when you were search, searching for Stiefel, Stiefel is put in German. The two top results were basically maps, no? And we thought probably there is something uh, really wrong in, in our uh, in, in our search, and we have to improve it, no? And something uh, similar happened with iMac where the top, in the top results you have some shoes. So the question was, how can we fix this issue? Because we believe this, there is some issues. And in our team, we have some tools to do it. So we have search management. Search management basically means that you can create a, a manual rules, no? Where you can say for the query stiffer, no? Push these uh, maps down. So the possibility we had in our in our company but this solution has some disadvantage no we, we only solve the problems we can see so that's a problem number one no and the other one is that we do not so solve the underlying issue it, it's like uh, if you are sick and you just take uh, some uh, a pills for the pain no uh, then you, you are still going to get sick, maybe two, two hours, or one day you are feeling okay, but the next day you are going to feel the pain again. So there's some disadvantage with this solution. So we decided not to go with that. Uh, so for, for other cases we do it. And there was another option, no? We already have implemented learn to rank And in this case, it's machine learning. So what you do is basically, let's use us decide what a product's going with positions, no? And this is a solution, of course, but it also has some disadvantage, no? And one of the disadvantages is that it only works for, for queries with enough searches and clicks. So maybe you can solve the head. Maybe if you are really good, you can solve the base. But what happened with all these uh, short tests, all these queries that have only a few, a few searches, but in aggregate make a lot of volume, search volume. So that's something a disadvantage. Another one is that if you are using learning to rank, or at least the way we are doing, is that you re-rank only the top X positions. No, it can be the top 24, the top 20. It depends on your shop, on what you have seen in, in your A-B testing. But that means that in the best scenario, these maps are going to appear in the position X minus one and X, no? So that means that the problem is not solved 100%. So with machine learning. So then we thought, what is our other solution? So let's look actually at try to understand the problem no, and try to fix it. So what we saw is that if you look at the product map, no, at least the two, these two in the top position, what happened is that the brand name contains the word Stiefel, uh, Stiefel. And that was, that, why, that was the reason why it was pushing so high. So it seems that we can fix the problem as following. So we only, sorry. So we only have to, uh, we only have to decrease the boosting, no? So we can formulate an hypothesis. If brand boost decrease, then we are going to increase the K, um, sorry, search KPI. Your search KPI can be click through rate, maybe SAR, whatever, no? In our case, it, it was click through rate, no? Uh, so we have an hypothesis and then we have an, an action. Now, if this hypothesis is true, then we just have to decrease actually the boost. It seems quite simple, but there are many ways, actually infinitely uh, ways to choose what, which, which uh, boost to choose in your brand, no? So we, in order to solve this problem, we have to make some assumptions to simplify our problem. So this is the first step we have we did at the, at this point at this moment. So our first assumption was actually the optimal value is between zero and the current value. This is consistent with our assumption, not that we have to decrease the boost. That's okay. The other one was to, uh, that our KPI is a continuous function of boost, and as a consequence, is that we don't. We do not need to find the optimal value, but we just need to be close to the optimal value, no? So now it seems that what we can do, I hope you see my mouse. So we can just, uh, for instance, this interval uh, between zero and my current value, I can break it into points, no? And I can change my algorithm uh, by changing the weights of the brand boost here, 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 and here. And then I can do an A-B test, no? Quite simple and see which one is, which of the variants win. Does the, the variant here in the middle win, or maybe setting equals to zero wins? So it seems quite simple, no? 
if you are, if you are doing A-B testing. But there are some issues if you try, try to do A-B testing at this point. And the first one is that it's going to be quite expensive, at least in time, because if you have more variants, you have to run the A-B test longer. No, that's one thing. The other one is that I'm pretty sure that some of these weights are going to return really bad result. I think a clear, uh, maybe a, an intuitive example is that if you set the brand uh, boost equals to zero, maybe you are going to increase the no result rate. And this is something you should avoid. So it seems that running an A-B test at this point is not really a good idea and we should do something else. So we are going to set a new objective, okay? So we are going to not going to try to optimize at the beginning the on the search KPI, on the click through rate, but we are going to find the boost that maximizes uh, the offline metric, no? Using using past behavioral data. An offline metric is a measure of ranking quality and it's a proxy for the KPI. So what are examples of online metrics? If you know, probably you know already NDCGs, it was talking all, all the talks, no? Uh, other could be DCGs, uh, other examples could be, could be precision. We are going to uh, talk a little bit more about precision later on. And here we have to make some assumptions. So one of the assumptions will be that if we increase the offline metric, no? On the NDCG, for instance, then we are going to improve, improve the KPI. So we have to introduce a new assumption. But what is nice about this assumption is that we can always, and we will afterwards validate with an A-B test, no? So this is what we are going to do. And this is what we did. So what we did is we divide the space, no? It was kind of evenly. And then for each brand boosting, what we did is just to calculate the offline metric. In our case, the offline metric was actually precision at 24. Uh, and there were they were quite of kind of interesting findings. So the first uh, finding was that the optimal value, it seems that it lies between these two points. No, we decide maybe here it's the it's maybe here. The other other finding was maybe the function looks a little bit quadratic, so we can approximate the of this offline precision as a function of the brand boost. Something also something interesting is that we also try to do the same for the NDCGs to see which one was the best uh, candidate for an A-B test, which plant boost. But the, we have a problem, and it was that we didn't see any significance difference between our contrafactual. A contrafactual can is an, a change in the in the algorithm, so a change in the uh, in our boosting in this in this case. So we didn't see it, no. And so that that. I raise, raise two questions. The first one is, why could we learn something with one metric, but not with another one? And this, this is a, a question we are going to ask afterwards because it's a really interesting question and it's coming all the time when we are doing Bayesian optimization and offline metric. And the second one is actually, it, it, it seems quite clear how actually to choose uh, your candidates, your counterfactuals, your boost, uh, because it's one dimensional and we have an interval. So that was quite simple. But sometimes you have more dimensions and you want to do more complex things and it is not quite clear how to choose the counterfactual, how to choose the different ways uh, how to change the algorithm. And that's why we introduce also Bayesian optimization that is going to also be discussed in a few uh, minutes. So now that we run our offline evaluation, we can do some actions, no? So we can decide actually, we have a candidate for the A-B test, no? Is this a brand boosting uh, that actually opt, uh, has the highest uh, precision at 24? We can formulate an hypothesis. We said actually the new boosting will improve our click-through rate. And this hypothesis is a little bit better than the previous one where I just said, just decrease the, the, boost, the brand boosting because that was not so well defined. There were many ways, no? That's one thing. Uh, so this is what we did. So basically we just can run an A-B test here. Uh, and we, do, we did the A-B test. And our find findings were quite interesting because this is one of the few A-B testing where we see actually after a few days uh, that the click-through rate for the new variant was better than the default variant. So here in the top plot, what we have is the click-through rate, no, the credible interval. The pink one is for the new variant. The blue one is for the for the default for the search algorithm without any change. And we see that the pink. Uh, Pink, pink curve is actually above. 
And in the middle, you can see that the probability of winning of the new variant was <laughs> even uh, 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 at the day already two, we have already enough data to have to say actually the probability of winning was almost 100%, which is almost never the case in A-B testing uh, that we do. Uh, so it seems that actually the way we choose actually the over brand boost was really actually clever, no? In a way, actually, uh, it was better than just uh, setting to zero or something else. So, but I think the idea here is that or the, the takeaway here is actually how do we how can we do an experimental process no and the first actually skeleton is doing as follow so we have an offline evaluation no but we define the counterfactuals it's just the change in the algorithm in our case it's just the change of the boost things no uh, then we also estimate the offline metrics for for the counterfactuals and afterwards we can just choose the maximum the maximum a counterfactual or the best counterfactual, not the one to maximize my uh, offline metric. And if this is higher than my benchmark, I can just run an A-B test. And in the A-B test, I can decide if the new variant goes live or not, no? So this is what this is my skeleton. But there are some problems or actually problems with this approach. So the first one is that running counterfactual is computationally expensive, no? That's one thing. Uh, the other one I, I mentioned a few minutes ago is that it is unknown how to define our counterfactual. In our case, it was mm, quite simple with the brand boost because we only try to optimize one uh, field oh? and we have an interval and then we just can split everything evenly, evenly, evenly. But uh, things can become more complicated with two dimensions, three dimensions, you have the course of dimensionality. So that's a problem. So there are some solutions, no? We can try to opt, opt, or automate the search for the optimal counterfactual using Bayesian optimization. So that's the main driven of the Bayesian optimization. And then uh, when we find the, the optimal value in the Bayesian optimization, we can run the offline evaluation with the optimal and see if it's better than on say the benchmark, on say the default algorithm. If it is better, then this is like a testing and a testing, a, then we can run an A-B test, no? So it seems that just by setting a Bayesian optimization, we can improve our process. But, uh, and I think uh, this is the, a lot of value but uh, for Bayesian optimization. And we did uh, already some experiments there, but every time we did a Bayesian optimization, or oh, quite often, we run into one of the main problems or, or, or the big questions. Which offline metric should I optimize? I mean, I'm, I'm I, I told you that we use precision at 24, but probably if you have been to many talks, there, there are a lot of teams or companies that are using NDCG. Uh, I think uh, other companies are using uh, DCG. I uh, if, even if you are using NDCG, no, probably you are using NDC at 24. And uh, it is not, uh, there is no unique way or method to scale actually the DCG. So this is a, a discussion we have in the, in the course uh, by Doc Tan, but what he says actually there is no unique in, in his company. Uh, when, uh, when they were discussing the NDCG, they discovered that three people in the team have different concepts about how to, to define NDCG, because how do you take the maximum? Do you take that from the top K, no? Or do you take overall? Uh, this problem is actually also the same for the precision, as we will say, see quite soon. So it's not quite clear. Uh, and so let's try to find out which metric is a bad metric. Okay, which metric we shouldn't use. Uh, sorry to disappoint you because I'm not going to tell you which metric is the best one. But I think uh, just uh, just trying to find out what is bad generates a lot of value. I think so. In order to understand actually a metric or metrics, uh, I think it's it's worth to ask uh, again another question. So I think so, and the question is, how do you know if a change in my algorithm improves the search results? No, this is uh, the question I have when I'm optimizing, when I'm doing offline evaluations, and uh, the way I I see if something is successful or not is just comparing a, an offline metric, no, some precision in my in my case the precision between the two algorithms, no. I'm talking here precision because the definition is quite simple. So the precision is the fraction of products retrieved that are relevant to the user's information need. So in this example on the right, 
So I have a, a user search, a search for something, they have a query. We return 12 products, no? If three or if the top three of them are relevant, then my precision in, in this case is three divided by 12, which is equals to 0 0.25. So the definition, it's quite straightforward. But usually you are actually looking for the top, you're interested on the, on the top positions. And the reason is that nobody, or oh, nobody cares what are the results in the top uh, in the position 100 or in position 100 because no mo almost nobody is clicking there i'm i'm uh, uh, you can look at your data and probably the click uh, the, pro uh, the probability that somebody clicks there is almost zero let's put it like this so you are interested in something else probably and it's something like precision at k no so precision at k you can define as the fraction of products at the top k position no that are relevant to the user information need. So for instance, precision at three in this case will be equals to one because you have three products in the top three position, of course, and the three of them are relevant. So that's the way we define it in our company. Now you can also define precision at six, no? And in this case, it will be one half because you have six products in the top six position by definition, and three of them are relevant. So one, three divided by six, one half. So it seems a quite straightforward. What so? What is the big issue? <laughs> so the first thing is that always the devil is in the details, no? And I mentioned I use the word relevant, and the question is, uh, wait a minute, what? How do you define relevant? Uh, so at least the way we define relevant is we use uh, use use behavioral data as a signal for relevant. So we calculate the judgments. I, I'm not going to go into details into what is a judgment because there are already good a presentation about that by Rene, for instance. Uh, so if you want uh, the link, we can uh, give you afterwards. But it's just a signal for relevance. No, if something is clicked more often, probably it's more relevant. Of course, you have to adjust for some other uh, parameters, and that's why you have to use a, a Bayesian statistics. But that's the point. So that's one thing. No. Uh, that's the definitions we the data the, the, we do use behavioral data for the, the relevance, uh, but we also define a relevant product for a query. Uh, we say if uh, the, the judgment belongs to the top X position, okay, that's the way we define uh, if a product is relevant or not. Now you can I, I hope somebody of you jump from the from your chair and say wait a minute I don't like these definitions uh, wait a minute what is uh, this X I have no idea. So, of course, if you disagree, I will say it's good to disagree. So, how do you choose the X? No. The other one, maybe some of you look at the data and say, wait, I mean, I don't like this definition because actually this precision cannot be, sometimes it cannot be between zero and one. No, if you, if the query returns a few products, then the best possible precision is not necessarily one. I mean, look at it. Uh, I can give you some example in my shop. Maybe you can say it. If if I look for this pro, if I look for this query, my I re I only get two products. And if my precision, if my x is ten, so I have ten percent. What is the ten percent of two? So I think there is some issue uh, with your definition, and I I I wouldn't disagree. No. So we can try to refine our our uh, uh, precision. No. So that's why. We define the normalized precision. A normalized precision, I'm not going into details because I don't want to convince you that normalized precision is better than precision. That won't be the, my point. But the normalized precision, my point is just at this point is only to the state. Normalized precision is just to have a precision that is between zero and one and is one just when it is the best precision, the best possible position. No? Now, now I have two. I have two, two definitions, two, two, two offline metrics, normalized precision, precision, but I have a, a, K, a, a K can be three, one, six, 24, 30. I think my, my best possibilities of offline metrics I can do already increase, and I haven't even talked about NDCGs, so let's stop there. So let's stop about talking about metrics and let's go to the interesting questions. How do I know which metrics to use? That's what I want to know. No, I, I, that's at, at the end my goal. No, and in order to um, answer this question, I have to. I, I know. I must. I must know which metric uh, is good. What kind of qualities must it satisfy? And I think there are two points that a metric must satisfy. So one is that if two algorithms are equivalent, then both 
must have the same metric value. And I'm pretty sure that if you have a, if you have your, your offline metric, NDC, whatever, and uh, you have two algorithms that are almost are identical, then your precision, then if you calculate your offline metric, you will get the same values. Maybe if you are doing something really strange with the null values, trying to do some uh, random stuff, maybe it's not going to be the same, but on expectation is the same. So I think if you are doing something not so crazy, that's always satisfied. The other criteria is that if one algorithm is better than the other, than another one, then I would prefer a metric that clearly shows which algorithm is better, no? And I have to be really, we have to be really careful with what is clearly, no? Because if I have a, if I have a two algorithm, have a one algorithm and one with, I get precision of two and, or zero comma, or zero comma two and the other, and with the normalized precision, I get a value of nine, zero comma nine. Uh, I cannot say that a normalized precision is better because it has a higher value and it gives me higher signal. I, this is something I cannot do because I'm comparing orange with apples. No, I have to. I have. I need a framework in this case that I so that I can compare all kind of met, offline metrics. And the way we are going to do it is going to use Bayesian statistics. No, you can also use Bootstrap C test. The idea it will be almost the same, but we are going to use Bayesian statistics. Okay. And how are we going to solve this? So what we are going to do is all ask us the following question. What is the probability that the new variant win? Okay. On the two scenarios, the first, first one is when the new variant is better or worse. Okay. That's one scenario. The second scenario is when the new variant is on average equal than the default algorithm. Okay. So these are two scenarios. And I can, I can say, okay, what is a good metric? A good metric will give you high probability in scenario one. So it should be the case, no? Ideally, it should be, probability should be 100, no? That would be ideal. And it will give, it will give you probability of 50% in scenario two, no? Because the algorithm, the, the metric shouldn't dis distinguish which algorithm is better or worse, no? Because they are not, they are not uh, different on average. So this is the way we are going to do it, okay? So, now, how do I, how do I build actually, how do I know which algorithm is better than or better or worse or equal than another one? I need to build ground truth, no? And unfortunately, I cannot use behavioral data because behavioral data does not tell you the ground truth. The only thing I can do is just run simulations and, and compare things. So, in order to run simulation, this kind of agent-based modeling where you uh, make microscopic assumptions, no? My microscopic assumptions can be, for instance, the rank one ranking is perfect or the ranking is perfect plus some noise, no? The ranking is perfect plus make some errors. I can also make some kind of assumptions on one of the algorithm. I can also say the ranking is perfect plus some noise plus make some errors. I can make all these kind of scenarios, no? With, with different uh, distributions. And I can also play a little bit with my with my shop, no? For instance, in my case, I know that some queries return you, for instance, hundred of, of of results, maybe some of them thousand. That's maybe not so problematic between precision and normalized precision. But some of them might you return just a few products, no? And this is where things are becoming tricky between my precisions, no? So I can play also with this and and make it a random variable, the number of results, no? So now I have co constructed my ground truth. And now I think this is one of the most interesting uh, plots uh, in this presentation, because here, what I'm doing is trying to compare which metric is better or than the other ones. So I'm going to explain the one on the top left. So this one, I hope you see my mouse. And here, what I can see is First, the first interesting finding is that the green, the green gel, the, the green line, is actually the precision, uh, the, the precision I defined at the beginning. And what I see is that the probability of we, uh, the probability of winning, this is my x-axis, no, uh, decrease as a function of k, which k is uh, yeah, the precision at three until thirty, which is something a, a little bit uh, bad because it says that my signal with this definition decrease as I increase the K, you know, that's something uh, bad. And something interesting that I see here also 
is that the orange line, which is my normalized position, this probability of winning do not decrease as a function of k, which is something really good, no? Uh, my signature shouldn't decrease as my, as my function as I increase my k. Uh, something also interesting, so I run different scenarios, no, on, on the different assumptions, and what it was kind of, what is consistent is that my normalized precision is always better than my uh, precision. That's something I can see. Sometimes I, I don't see difference between my precision, no, and the normalized precision when k is small, and it makes sense because this, uh, this metrics only are different when the number of products are small, no? And which is kind of equivalent when the K is uh, also small. So that's the first thing I, I, I see with my simulations. Uh, now, the next thing is that, okay, with these simulations, what can I learn? So how can I better uh, understand uh, my, my analysis with the data? How can I better understand my offline metric, my offline evaluation? How can I better understand my Bayesian optimization? How can I improve everything? No, and this is something interesting because what I'm showing you in these two uh, tables is basically two offline evaluations we run, no? When we just uh, make some change in the algorithm and try to see which variant won. And unfortunately, on the one on the left, the default won, no? But what I see here quite kind of interesting is that the probability of winning for precision at three and at six, actually it was uh, quite high. Well, if you look at the precision at 24, the probability decreased uh, quite significantly. If you look, and this is quite consistent also uh, to the one to the right, no? Where the probability of winning for precision at three and six was always higher than to precision at 24. So these are interesting. So now we see the relationship between uh, the empirical findings and the simulations. So I think what we, what we see here is that the reason the probability is lower at 24 is not because something on the algorithm, maybe the algorithm is better in the top 24 position or equal in the top 24 position, but much better in the top three position, but it's more because a consequence of the way we are defining our metric. So that's already something problematic, no? And uh, also we, we can also try to do it uh, Try to find out if our, if our metrics are bad in the sense that when there is no difference between the algorithms, uh, maybe your metric is going to tell you with high probability that one of the variants is better than the other one. Uh, so we run also some simulations. So on the top left, we see that on average, these three metrics are this, uh, the same for any K. So that means that the on average, the probability of winning of the best variant when both variants are equal, it's 50%, which makes a lot of sense, no? I'm going to jump a little, uh, be a little bit faster uh, here. Uh, I'm go just going to say that uh, also in this case, actually, the normalized precision uh, is better because uh, your variance is a little bit lower, so it has a better signal. It has a better signal that and tells you when actually things are equal. So it, in this in this case, scenario, is also it also won. And uh, just to summarize, actually, this section. Uh, the first thing is that a uh, normalized position seems to be a better actually at detecting which best ranking, which, which ranking is the best one. No? Uh, to be honest, our, as our results actually depend on the assumptions we make in our shop. So I think uh, some next steps and also try yourself is basically try to compare actually which metric are you, are you, are you using? No, are you, can you can you metric detect the improvements the improvements with your metric? So that's some, that's a question you can try to answer uh, yourself with your data and with your metrics and trying to do, run some simulation. You can try to copy or to try to do with patient uh, statistics, or you can try to uh, also use frequentist uh, statistics. So try try yourself to see actually which metrics is for you the best or for you not a good one, no. So I think at the end, I don't want to tell you that normalized precision is the best for your shop, but the, the, the takeaway, it should be, how can I find out that this metric is not a good one in my shop? And then I should actually try to find a better one. Uh, we should never, so another conclusion is that 
you should never forget that your conclusion are equal, equals to the data plus the assumptions. No, we sometimes think that we have big data and we can do vector search, but you should never forget about your assumptions. And the way to try to challenge your assumption is to do some kind of simulations, kind of agent based modeling, where you look at the microscopic assumptions of what you have and see what happened at the microscopic level and see if things are still making sense. So that's the way I see it. No. Now, I hope uh, you really like this uh, section, but uh, now we are over with this section, and now we are going to give a brief uh, overview of why what is Bayesian optimization. And maybe, Joel, can you share your screen? And Yes, thank you, Abel. Um, I will just quickly share my screen. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So let me give you a, a very brief uh, introduction to patient optimization. Um, the way we use it is basically as a strategy for finding promising candidates or counterfactual counterfactuals, as Abel um, called them, for our offline evaluation. And let me give you a quick recall where we want to use. Um, the Bayesian optimization. So recall that we have this cycle of offline evaluation and A-B tests. And one of the main uh, problems is how do we actually find new counterfactuals for our offline evaluation? And we could either, we could um, place an educated guess based on, based on the um, A-B test, which we had, or we could use Bayesian optimization and so to say, generate new candidates for our offline evaluation. And what we do is we have our offline metric in the offline evaluation, say precision. And what we do is we optimize um, our values, for example, our variables, uh, according to that metric in the Bayesian optimization. And what we get out of it are some values which in on our trained data set optimize the offline a metric and then we have a new candidate for our offline evaluation. And also because it performed good on the train data, there is a high chance that it also performs good in the offline evaluation. So this is the R use case. And let me give you a very high level overview of how it works. So we have uh, an expensive to evaluate function. In our case, this would be the offline metric. And we can evaluate it at single points, but we do not know um, the entire function as a function of all our variables, right? Abel talked about how we could have maybe, I don't know, we had around 25 variables. So there is no way we can actually know what the function looks like. So, and what we do is we basically start at some point and we evaluate it. Uh, we have Elliot our function. So in, here's, it says black fox functions. Uh, just imagine here is your offline metric. Then we get some value. And now we have an acquisition function. This is basically a function which based on our previous points decides a new point to evaluate. So this acquisition function decides on a new point and it sends it again to the black box function. Then we get another value out of it. And we repeat that until we have a uh, converged to some optimum or just until we ran out of iterations. And then in the end, we pick uh, our most optimal value, say X star. And this value then can be taken to the offline evaluation. Now, this seems very simple, right? You could just also use, why do, don't you just use a grid, right? Just make a grid uh, on your space and just uh, test every point on the grid. The main issue is that this black box function or the metric is very expensive to evaluate. So one of our goals here is to use as few points as possible. And, and let's see how this is actually done. So this acquisition function can choose between say two modes. It can either choose exploitation, which means it chooses a point which is very close to the previous points. And what that does it is it refines our local estimation of the function. 
So let's say you already have a good point. Then if you look close around it and if you don't find any better points, then probably your good point is an optimum. Now, the second um, option you have is exploration. And what that means is that you take a point which is far, far away from the points you already have. And what that does is that basically it extends your global estimation. Now, both of these uh, approaches are of course valid, but they come with their pros and cons. And I would quickly like to talk about them. So uh, first exploitation, the main benefit of exploitation is that it has fast convergence. And of course, that's the goal, right? We want to find an optimum. And so we want to converge towards it. And as I said, we want to converge fast because um, evaluating points is expensive. Unfortunately, there are some drawbacks, of course, because it might happen that we converge to the wrong point, maybe a local optimum. For example, in this picture here, you can see that we converge towards this local optimum, which is, of course, not uh, the global. In this case, we minimize, right? So in this case, this would be the, the global optimum. So we are far away from being optimal. And the reason that happens is because we didn't explore the entire space, right? So here between this point and this point, there's not a single point which was evaluated. So we have no idea how the function looks like. And also it heavily depends on the starting point, right? If you chose the starting point maybe here, then we might have converged here. If it chose the starting point here, we might have converged here. So this is also an issue. Now exploration does basically the opposite, right? By definition, we explore much of the space. And therefore, the, our choice of a starting point is almost irrelevant because we, we, we explore so much of the space anyway. So it didn't really, doesn't really matter where we started. And this also means that we are much more likely to find a good region. And what I mean by a good region is that we find a region where the optimum lies. Now, the almost game-breaking drawback of exploration is slow convergence. Basically, you can see in this example, of course, we have a time constraint, right? We can't iterate forever. So let's say we have only eight points we can evaluate. In this case, we still want to find this global minima here. But because we explored all the time, we just didn't get close enough to this point to actually converge. So. And slow convergence is, of course, uh, something we do not want. Now, as you can see, in the worst case, both methods actually fail. So what you have to do is a good acquisition function will combine the two ideas and sometimes exploit and sometimes explore. And, and in that way, you can actually get all the pros and avoid all the cons and hopefully get the result you want. Um, Yes, of course, uh, which acquisition function you have to use and which um, amount of exploitation and exploration you have to do, that very much depends on your application or uh, on your use case. For us, we also had to play around with the values and we also saw various varying degrees of success when choosing um, uh, this split. All right, that's already all of I wanted to say. Let me give you again a quick summary. So again, the, the idea is that we use Bayesian optimization to generate good candidates um, for the offline evaluation by optimizing for our offline metric. And the method is that we evaluate the metric at different points. And how we decide which points to evaluate is by this acquisition function. And again, this acquisition function has to have this balance between exploitation and exploration so that we can actually converge quickly whilst also exploring as much of the space as possible. And of course, the, find, the found point will hopefully be a good candidate for the offline evaluation. All right, that was my quick overview of patient optimization. And for the last slide, I will give back to Abel. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you very much, Joel. So I think we are just one slide uh, away from finishing the presentation. So I just want to make some conclusions. Uh, and I think the, most, the first is, uh, 
conclusion will be like experimentation of stats before actually starting an A-B test. I think a, a way, a good way to reduce your t uh, risk is basically doing offline evaluations. Uh, the other point is actually, if you want to sharp your hypothesis, I think a good tool is always to use, uh, or one of the tools is to use patient optimization when it is possible, no? Uh, Another th other conclusions will be that do not forget that data does not tell you the whole story, no? So you always challenge your assumptions uh, by running uh, simulations and exam exam examine uh, the cor corollaries of your assumptions, no? Uh, big data does do not solve all the issues, all the problems, no? Uh, I think it would be also nice to challenge uh, your offline evaluation. So I think this will be the takeaway from the second part of the presentation. And uh, something that we'll have to learn the hard way, way at least uh, I think all the search teams, and is that building an exper experimentation culture is a never ending story. So we are still trying new, st uh, new stuff. Uh, and I think uh, a good way to get new ideas uh, has been uh, at least uh, all these you know, conference and YouTube videos from Highstack. So that's why we also start patient optimization. Uh, and yeah, uh, that's it from our side. Fantastic. Thank you, Abel and, and Joel. Um, so we've got some time for questions now. Um, I'm just going to bring up the questions and I will ask these in turn. Um, if you ask several questions, I'll, I may um, let everybody else have a go before you uh, uh, get all of your questions asked, but uh, answered anyway. We're going to start off um, Andy Webb, Andy from the BBC. Um, how did you make the judgment set to be able to, to, be able to measure precision at 24, et cetera? Hey, can you repeat the question? Sorry. How did you make the judgment set to be able to measure precision at twenty-four? So I think uh, there. Are, uh, so the the way we define the judgment, I think, is also based on optimization. So or based, uh, no, based on uh, based on statistics. No. So we have to define uh, some priori and then calculate the click through rate uh, or the posterior click through rate. Uh, I think the best way to do, uh, if I if I have to tell you how to do it, the best way will to forward you the link from uh, 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 from OpenSearch. So that's the way we also did, I think. Uh, how do we get the data set? Um, I think that's a different question. I think we are using our self, uh, search tracking no? to calculate uh, how often people click and how, how many impressions does a product get. No, we also have to adjust from so, for some biases, no, uh, because you you know there is always the position bias. So if something is click on the top uh, position, is pro is is it can be the case it's not because it's not it's the most relevant uh, product, but it's just because it's uh, it's in the top position. So you have to there are I think there are, I cannot give you a definitive answer because it's really. It's a big thing. So it's uh, also something that, to be honest, is something that we also see in our company that we have to challenge ourselves uh, again and again, because also the way you adjust for the position bias, uh, you look at the judgment, uh, seems that sometimes the ER way off. So it's a never ending story because this, the, this is the uh, garbage in, garbage out, and you have always to challenge yourself. Thank you. Great. Um... So, uh, Jun Hu Zhang uh, asked, what tool are you using to do A-B testing? So, I, I think we are using our, uh, so the tool is quite big. So, in the sense that we are building our self actually tool. So, we are combining different tools. So, for the evaluation, we do a uh, Python. So, there are many libraries to do statistics. Uh, the data ingestions, we have also our self search tracking, but you can use a Snowplow or GEADAT. Google Analytics data, so that's not a big thing. Uh, just to do, if you saw the dashboard, uh, you can use Tableau, but I think the idea is it's, you can also do it in Data Studio. I think the the way we do it is just to to separate you no know, the different uh, uh, parts of the what that you need. You know. I hope that I answered your question. Okay, not, great. Um, I think you've answered this partly, Isaac's question about how you get the evaluation data set. How do you get the, can you say a bit more about that? How do you get the evaluation data set? So again, um, so the data we are getting for our own search tracking, but you can also get it from all other ones. Then for the evaluation data sets, we all, always have to be careful that because we are running a offline a vision optimization and offline evaluations, we have to be careful that 
we don't do not overfit. So the offline evaluations, uh, it's also a way to test uh, if you uh, the result of your patient optimization. So there we also do some kind of separation of the queries. So I think something interesting that we also, you at least you have to do is actually which queries are you going to get in the evaluation? Are they going to be the top queries? Are they going to be the, the top X percent, the top 3,000? No. And they have to be consistent in the train and the test data set that goes into patient optimization and open evaluation and um, yep that's something you have to be careful and there is no straight way to that i can tell you use the top a uh, 30 percent top of top 10 percent because it also depends on how many clicks do you get in each of the on the products so there is no straight uh, answer if i don't see the data so it, it it depends on the data i can tell you okay thank you uh, so, Christina, and yes, thank you, Christina, for, for um, writing it in uh, non Cyrillic letters. That was confusing me for a while. Um, you said that you train your metrics to get parameters for the offline testing to train after that again and so on. Doesn't it lead to overfitting? I think this is something uh, we just answer a little bit. So, we have to be careful that in the patient optimization, you use a different data set, no? And in the offline, uh, Basin, uh, and then the offline evaluation, you use a test data set. And you have to be careful. Uh, this is something we did uh, wrong uh, at the beginning is that this, uh, the, these queries, no, and the train on the test data set have, they must have the same uh, uh, properties, no, they have to come from the same data generating process. You cannot have in the test, in the train data set, uh, queries that are from the top 1% and maybe in the test data set queries that are in the top uh, 50% because from the properties are different or how people actually search, no, it's different. So the top 1% maybe are queries that are shorter. So if you any e-commerce, maybe people are uh, searching for iPhone, uh, Apple, no, Apple is already a brand, but if they are doing into, if you are going a little bit down, so the queries are a bit longer. So you can, so the, the properties are different. So you have to be careful on that. Uh, but to overfit and not to not over overfit, you have to separate uh, test and train data set. I hope I answered your question. Great, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Jiti Zhang has another question. Uh, would it make sense to use metrics in different cases? For example, standard precision where you're interested in top one with few products, but NDCG when the evaluation evaluation should go beyond the top with many products. Can you could you guess why NDCG is working better in your case? Uh, so I think uh, should can you use different metrics for different cases? The answer uh, is yes. I think uh, what we try to see or what we try to show in the second part of the presentation is that I think the most interesting because NDCG the way you define it's always a. Uh, the devil is in the data, it's not so the definition of Wikipedia is really nice, but when you have data, you have to handle with null values, you have to say, okay, how do I define the ITL, no? So that's not so straightforward. Uh, so that's that's for me the most important thing, challenge your, your, your metrics that you have, and there is a framework to do it at. Uh, but of course, the, there is a reason for sometimes a switching pro to do NDCGs and sometimes to use precision. So this is something we haven't constrained ourselves. I think the good way about having one metric is that you can automate, no? And you can make decision automatically. Uh, then the second question: Why is why actually NDCGs was not working in your case? Can you guess why? I think uh, there is a reason we didn't talk in the second part of the presentation about NDCG, and the reason is that I think it's something that probably there is a pack. <laughs> there is one possibility. No, you can never reject. Uh, so I would I would say in your case, if it's working for you, NDC, you should stay with NDCG. And if in our case it's not working, I think it's something that we have to, uh, we, we will challenge ourselves. And we don't have in the presentation because it's, 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 it's something that's really huge, no? In the sense that it will generate a lot of value if, if we understand why it's not as good as the precision, because we see in all the presentation, the precision is being used. No, we also use in learning to rank uh, NDCGs and it seems to be working. So I think there is a lot of uh, learnings there for another presentation. Really. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Christina has another couple of questions. I'm going to start with what tool do you use for tracking the data for offline tests? 
I think uh, I already answered the question. So I think uh, the, 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 the tool that you're using for your tracking, uh, for your offline uh, test, uh, it should be ideal case, the one you are using for your reporting. So in our case, it's actually the own implementation of, of own implementation, but you can, there, there are other tools and I, I think they will generate almost the same value if you have the team for that, no Google Analytics or Snowplow, another option in the market. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Isaac's next question. The other big problem with offline evaluation is that you typically have a discrepancy between offline and online metrics. Uh, any reason not to run an online learner to avoid most, if not all, problems with offline learning? Uh, can you repeat the question again so that I don't? Uh, the other big problem with offline evaluation is that you typically have a discrepancy between offline and online metrics. Any reason not to run an online learner to avoid most, if not all, the problems with offline learning? So I think uh, so the discrepancies between the offline metrics and the, and the online metrics, I think it lies on the assumptions that actually there is a positive correlation, no? Uh, if you see it quite often in your case, no? So I will challenge I will challenge your offline metric, no? Because maybe there is something wrong. Try to, again, try to see how to find out if it is the bad one, uh, just uh, with using the framework I did or we present. Uh, but I, I, I don't think there should be a big discrepancy between offline metrics and online metrics. I didn't present it here, but uh, last, I think at the beginning of last year, so one year ago almost, uh, we did actually, uh, we run the, an A-B test and we calculate the positions, uh, positions and also the click through rate. And we didn't, we see a good trend, no? Uh, so I don't see any reason why they should Fair, no. Uh, I think I also didn't mention uh, there was an A-B test, no? Uh, where basically our offline metrics say, go for it. Uh, and in the A-B test, it was really clear that it was really bad, no? But we did no iterations uh, with the offline metrics, of course, and with a lot of learnings at the query level, how the engineers could improve. Uh, and at the end, we make some tune, uh, fine tunes and we improve the or search at least uh, the the uh, off online uh, KPI increase. So, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I'm just going to go for one last question from Isaac here. Uh, does your search and ranking take historical interactions into account? Uh, what is historical interaction? Because it seems like some... Isaac, are you still online? Do you want to just uh, clarify that question? Can I mute yes. yourself? Yes. Yeah, so the actually the, the biggest thing is, of course, that if you take interaction into account, you run an A-B test, uh, you need to keep the interactions between the variants completely separate, which is not always done in my experience. Uh, are you aware of this problem? Have you seen this happen? Do you know how big of a problem that is? Um, I, I, we have, I, actually, the, the, we have a, so, like, how could I call it? So we have collected a lot of uh, pain points for A-B tests where we see uh, big issues uh, that can happen because of assumptions of the A-B test, no? Uh, I can tell you that one of the uh, big things that I didn't know uh, two months ago, and it turns that it was uh, huge, is that, for instance, if you have B2B co uh, customers, no? Um, or you have a bot that always occur, no? And you run the A-B test, no? And only 5%, I can send you later the link. I have, I did some simulations and they are in Data Studio. And if you run the A-B test, no? Uh, the false uh, positive rate significantly increase if you have actually bots or B2B customers. And the reason is that there is some correlations between the behavior if you are doing the analysis at the session level, uh, but actually how people, they, there is a correlation at the user or the visitor level. So this is this is something that I was really surprised that it can happen. Uh, and it seems that in many of our A-B tests, uh, for other products, it was not so big, but the problem in, in, in the search is that 
how do you define an observation and how are they independent? No, because if you are looking at the query level, when, when somebody looks for an iPhone and somebody looks uh, uh, later for a smartphone, this one user is actually, the, uh, there's an interaction between these observations, no, and there is a high correlation. And this correlation can actually have a huge impact in your A-B testing. Uh, this is something that actually I'm worried, and this is something that we have to handle it because I think it can actually increase your false positive rate significantly. Yeah, but that is mostly due to outliers, and typically outliers that are not affected or that you could not affect due to your fraud. Not necessarily like, outliers. So we did we run some simulations. Places a huge order. That Sorry? might be a bot that comes by and places uh, uh, lots of clicks or indeed uh, a big business that places a huge order, which happens to be one variant, might yep. be enough to skew it all the way if you're looking like at the yep. average or mean value for something. That is something you can filter out if you can detect that. But yep, of course. Uh, but if you have, for instance, uh, a ranking, your base ranker, production ranker, and you implement uh, some spellings correction. Now, if you run this A-B test, then your base ranker, if you do not separate the traffic, we'll be able to see what the spelling correcting version is doing purely to the fact that you have seen interactions on products that it would otherwise not return. Yep. Do you deal with that? Uh, I, 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 can't, I don't think uh, this is something we have uh, covered right now in our A-B testing, but this is, it is a good point. And I think we can have a look at discussion afterwards. Thank you, Isaac. Thanks all. Thanks everyone for your questions. I think we're going to leave it there. Um, so I'd like to thank, uh, firstly, Abel and Joel for, for speaking today. Um, thanks for bringing your insights. This is what Haystack's all about, is sharing uh, information so we can all learn from each other. So thank you both. Thank you um, very much. So I'm just going to give you a few updates on other things that are happening soon. So. Um, We've got more coming with Haystack. Uh, we will have uh, Haystack uh, live back here on the 7th of 15th with Andreas Wagenmann on Calibri. Hope you can join us there. As I mentioned, next week, myself and René Kriegler are going to be in uh, Paris uh, for Haystack on tour. And we're actually interested in bringing Haystack to other cities, uh, these short, short events. So do get in touch if, you, if you're interested in helping us with that. We'd like to work with local partners if we can. Um, next Wednesday, Search Solutions in London, a small event. I believe there are still spaces for that one. Do come along if you can. Um, do jump into Relevant Slack if you're not there already. I suspect most of you are. Um, and it's great to be able to share things off uh, 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 continuously there and ask questions and get help. And all these talks from Haystack events are on our YouTube channel. Do check that out. I think we've got over 100 videos now about different aspects of search and relevance. And uh, it's becoming a fantastic resource. So uh, thank you very much again, Abel and Joel. We'll be back here on Haystack Live on December the 15th. And um, my name is Charlie Hull. I'm from Open Source Connections. We're the Search and Relevance people. And we're very happy to host Haystack Live. Thank you very much, everybody. And good night.